All right, I'm seeing uh, we've got a, a fair amount of current one uh, on our webinar today. So welcome. Uh, it's good to, to see you all again. Uh, we have a number of peers from ed adjacent organizations or other nonprofits, uh, along with a handful of community members. Um, so a really diverse group of people. Um, we're, we're excited to get to talk to you about some of our work in collaboration with some of our colleagues today um, and excited to hear your questions uh, about how school leaders impact post-secondary success. Not only do I get to um, open today's webinar, um, I also have the honor of being your host today, um, but it's not going to be just me. Um, we have some really amazing guests um, who are also going to be participating in our webinar. And so just to quickly introduce them, uh, I'm joined by Lauren Sartain, who is a professor at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill and an affiliated researcher at the U Chicago Consortium and the co-author of Training and Retaining Effective School Leaders, who's going to share her research results shortly. Also joining us are Narita Graham, the principal at Cairo Junior Senior High School in Illinois, uh, and Jennifer Kermis, the executive director of teaching and learning for the Illinois State Board of Education. Uh, today is going to be all about exploring the cru crucial role of school leaders in shaping students' post-secondary outcomes. Before we get into today's conversation and some of Lawrence's research, I do want to just share a little bit of information about or, our organization for those of us who are joining us for the first time. And so at Wongol, uh, our vision is that every student will have an equitable opportunity to achieve their greatest post-secondary aspirations. In our country right now, only 22% of students from low-income backgrounds earn a post-secondary degree compared to 67% of their peers from high-income areas. And so our mission is to lead the movement to transform post-secondary advising support. We know that students from low-income communities and high-income communities aspire to complete their post-secondary education at similar rates, uh, but those from low-income low, low communities, the majority of whom are students of color, face enormous systemic barriers to earn their degree. Uh, at Wungle, uh this year, we'll reach over 15,000 students across our classroom-based module in six regions, and the Wongo Leadership Network in Illinois, Kentucky, Massachusetts, and Michigan. Uh, and you can learn more about our organization by visiting our website, which we'll drop in the chat momentarily. When we work with communities, we work with them through two types of partnerships. Um, our classroom model, which is a program and curriculum delivered directly to high school juniors and seniors. Uh, and so just like math and English are taught to students, we believe that post-secondary planning must be taught to students and that teachers and school staff must be coached effectively to deliver that knowledge. Uh, and our Wungle Leadership Network, uh, which is focused on building the capacity of school and district leaders through ongoing coaching and communities of practice with their peers. Um, we'll, we'll launch one more poll uh, in just a minute here um, and want you to think about what are the highest impact levers that school leaders can pull to influence student post-secondary outcomes? Um, so you'll see that poll momentarily um, and take a minute to reflect and then record your response. Take about another 20 seconds to record your response if you haven't yet done so. We'll um, share those results back with you momentarily. So you should be able to, to see the results on your screen right now. Um, and re really interesting to see where, where this group of, of people is landing on this question. Uh, a lot of energy around integrating post-secondary readiness into their overall strategic plan and structure, um, but still a fair amount of responses on the, the other response categories on here around helping uh, build a team around post-secondary readiness, working directly with counselors, thinking about course sequence and path pathways, and ensuring that there's data access around post-secondary data. Um, so I'm going to um, bring on momentarily uh, Lawrence Artain, uh, again, an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill and an affiliated researcher at the UChicago Consortium, who um, will be joining us today to share the insightful findings from her research. Um, so with that, I will turn things over to Lauren. 
Thanks, Andy. And I'm excited to be here with you guys today. And thank you, Wang Gol, for putting together such an awesome panel. Um, I'm really excited about this because I think this is how research is most powerful when we can connect with practice and policy and really have a good conversation about um, what these findings can look like on the ground in schools. And so, as Andy said, I'm a faculty member at UNC Chapel Hill in the School of Education. I came here in 2019, but before that, I was at the University of Chicago Consortium on School Research um, for a very long time, and that is where this research started. Um, often, I feel like as researchers, we're kind of telling you guys on the ground things you already know, right? And so, when I sit here and tell you that principles really, really matter, you know that, right? So hopefully this really resonates with you when we can um, provide some insight into how they matter and why they matter. Um, so research over and over again, not just my own, shows that principles matter a lot. They matter for things like teacher outcomes. Effective principles are great because they are really good at retaining teachers and retaining effective teachers. Effective principles set the stage in the school so that students can um, learn more, which shows up in higher test scores. But more importantly, which I'll talk about today, um, better principles are also uh, better able to help students think about like the transition out of high school and into young adulthood, college and the workforce. Um, so my research and all the research cited here and probably even more shows that having a more effective principle means that in a given school year, students are showing um, months of additional growth over students in school buildings with uh, less effective principals. Um, school buildings with more effective principals also have much higher rates of teacher retention and job satisfaction. And especially now, sort of in this post-pandemic educator labor market, that's really, really critical, right? Being able to keep teachers in buildings um, and much, much more. And a thing that I want to emphasize is we know that teachers are also really important um, and teachers impact their students directly, but principal effects are felt across the entire school building, right? So um, principals impact every single student in the building and every single teacher and staff in the building. So the research I'm going to talk about briefly today, and hopefully that we can engage more than me talking at you, um, is work that I started in Chicago a number of years ago. Um, and we were really looking at principles matter right now, right? Principles matter for test scores, but do those principles impacts, do those principal impacts carry over? Um, do they stick? So as students leave elementary school, leave middle school, go into high school, go into college, does the principle you had in middle school and elementary school still matter? And the answer is a resounding yes. And so I'm gonna show you that today. Um, in our study, we use over 20 years of longitudinal data, which means that we can see individual students, we can see the schools they intend, we can see who the principal is of that school, and then we can see a whole range of outcomes, immediate outcomes, and then later in life outcomes as well. Uh, the research, is um, set in two different places where we can look at different outcomes. So uh, we look at middle school, most Chicago schools, as many of you know, are K-8, um, but we're using that middle school year, that six, eight period. Uh, middle school principals in Chicago and Texas, we look at immediate outcomes like test scores, grades, attendance, discipline. Um, and in Chicago, we're also able to look at how principals influence school climate. And then we're looking at longer term outcomes, which we really care about, right? That's why we're here. And so using data from Texas, we're able to look at impacts on um, youth involvement in the juvenile justice system. Using both Chicago and Texas, we can look at college going and college um, persistence and degree attainment outcomes. Um, and then using Texas, we can look at labor market participation as well. Um, I'll skip the challenge part. Thanks. Okay, so our high level findings, one, principal effects on students. Again, this is your middle school principal, your grade six through eight principal. They matter into college, they matter into the workforce, okay? So it's not just, does it matter for me showing up today? Those impacts last, and that's really important. 
Um, and the second big finding is principals who positively impact test scores are also doing things that just make schools better places to learn and teach. Um, and so I think often in the education policy space, we focus on test scores because those are immediately available, um, but the outcomes that we care about are longer term, right? And so just because a principal is able to get students to have higher test scores may not mean other things are going on, but in this research, we find there are other things going on, right? So principals are creating like really strong climates for learning and teaching. And all of this together suggests that, you know, it's really worthwhile to think about how do we invest in both future school leaders in terms of identifying um, potential leaders, training them, and then once they are in the building, how do we continue to support them um, so that they can grow as well? Okay, so that first finding, just a little bit more on that. Effective principles have lasting effects on students. Um, so we see the principle that a student has when they are in the middle grades has immediate impacts on their academic outcomes. So immediate impacts on test scores, grades, and um, on social emotional outcomes as well. And those impacts last. So when we see the student had a more effective principle in grades K through eight, those students are also more likely to have um, higher GPA in ninth grade fewer absences, so they're coming to school more, right? Um, we see decreased likelihood of receiving disciplinary infractions, and we see that they have a better shot at enrolling in, and more importantly, persisting in completing college. Lauren, I'll, I'll jump in yeah, with uh, yeah, yeah. a question. Uh, the the breadth of um, impacts that, that principals are having in your study is, is really striking at the middle school level. And, and I think we can all relate to that uh, likely continues at the high school level in terms of uh, high school principal, principals affect student outcomes. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you learned differentiated most effective principals. I think that's a question that just came up in the in the chat as well. Yeah, that's great. Um... I think that transitions us to our next slide, even where we can talk about, you know, things that teachers said and students said about schools and about school leaders that um, were more effective. Thank you. Okay, so in Chicago public schools um, and lots of places across the country are doing school climate and school culture surveys as well now. Um, we have really rich data on teachers' experiences in their buildings. Um, and so Chicago Public Schools in partnership with the University of Chicago does annual surveys of all teachers. Um, and they have been doing this. And you probably know the answer to this for many, 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 many years, okay? Um, and so, you know, using the administrative data, the test score data to identify the principles where the principles in schools where students see the most growth. These are the kinds of things that teachers say are happening on the ground, right? Um, so in those high growth schools with more effective principles, teachers are saying that school leaders are doing a really good job of communicating their vision for the school. Um, teachers feel that their leaders understand how students learn, what it's like to be in the classroom. They set really high standards for student learning they, and they have really clear and high expectations of their teachers as well. They tend to be very data-driven and data-focused. And so they're tracking student academic progress, probably not just in the aggregate, but like following individual student progress and having um, very focused conversations about students. Um, and teachers felt like in these schools, the principals and school leaders really um, pressed them to, you know, not just get professional development, but then also take what they're learning and implement in the classroom. And so from that same um, survey, Chicago Public Schools also um, survey students in grades six through 12. Um, and so again, these are these middle grade students talking about what it's like to be in school buildings where we're able to identify principals were more effective. And so these are students own survey responses. This is what they're saying um, it's like to be in those kinds of buildings, right? So 
first and foremost, they feel safe in their school. They feel safe in the hallways of the school, in the bathrooms of the school, um, on school grounds. They feel safe, right? That's really important. You can't really get to the higher level things without that safety. Um, they also felt the same sort of focus on academic press and academic rigor, rigor and academic support that the teachers felt, right? So they thought that the topics that they were studying were interesting, challenging, relevant for them, and they felt motivated to work really hard um, to do the best that they could on their assignments. Lauren, I'd love to um, bring in Narita um, to kind yeah, of hear her reflection on some of this research. And, and just Narita, curious to hear um, your reflections on the link between student engagement, student safety, student belonging, and supporting students' post-secondary readiness. Yes. Hey, everyone. I am very excited to be here with you all today. I am Narita, principal here at Carroll Junior Senior High School. Um, just a quick interesting fact about me, I have an early childhood background, and this is my second year at the secondary level. Um, when it comes to student engagement and safety, both sets the tone to prepare our students for success. Um, without the student engagement, our students would be more likely to not show any interest in their future careers. So as administrators, I do feel that it is very important for us to evaluate the curriculums that we are using and just making sure that they are challenged and making sure that the students are able to connect and uh, build off of those prior experiences because then they're more likely to become active participants in their learning and want to continue on. And it helps us build on their interests to prepare them for their futures, as well as when it comes to safety, um, it's pretty much, I know that sometimes we are known as chaos coordinators and that's just the reality of it, but we all know that we cannot thrive in an environment where students don't feel safe, whether that's inside, outside of school, in the hallway. So it's very important to have measures put in place to make sure that our schools are safe, whether that's metal detectors or security, um, just making sure we have that active supervision and conflict resolution going on in schools because if students are constantly worried about what's gonna happen next or fights and things of that nature that may be occurring or when I walk out in the hallway, am I gonna to have to protect myself? That really just creates a tense environment where anxiety levels are high for both staff and students and it keeps us from making the progress that we need to support them. And when they feel like they belong, um, that just comes from building those relationships, making them feel important, and they're more likely to trust us and allow us to support them in the work that we are doing when it comes to the post-secondary readiness. I appreciate you sharing that, Narita. And I think the um, re reflection about students not feeling intense and feeling a sense of belonging really links to making sure that they have a positive advising experience. If I'm a student and I don't feel like I belong or I feel tensed up all the time, I'm not going to talk to a counselor or a teacher about where I want to go and what I'm worried about and what I really want to do two years from now or four years from now. Um, so that that just really, really resonates with me. And I think I hadn't always thought about that link between student engagement and post-secondary interests related to the courses you're taking. If you're engaged in a CTE course around manufacturing, that's going to help you advance in your post-graduation journey. Um, so I appreciate you, you sharing those two, two thoughts. You're welcome. I'm going to um, pass things back to, to Lauren to talk a little bit about um, what can we do to strengthen principal's leadership so that they're able to do the things that she just detailed and that Narita just detailed. Um, thanks, Andy. Um, so I'm going to do a little mix of talking like outside of my research and inside of my research here. And I'm really glad that we have Jen from ISBE on the call too to help talk about some of the state's efforts. Um, so thinking about, you know, really intentional policy and practice efforts to strengthen principal leadership, right? If we know principals are really important, um, then how do we ensure that we're strengthening, diversifying the pipeline and supporting folks for our AM buildings? Um, so 
taking that second group, right, our, our current principals who are in schools, um, thinking about different ways um, that we can mentor and support, particularly new principals, right? This is a really big pivot for folks, typically coming from an AP position where um, this is changing in some places, but not in a lot where APs tend to do, you know, discipline or bus duty um, and making sure so when they transfer into the principalship, like thinking about like, what are the supports and mentorship that they really need to make that shift sort of um, second in command um, to really being able to set a strong school climate. And then not just for new principals, right? Like thinking about different ways to offer continuous learning opportunities for all principals. Um, and also thinking about like, once we, once a district identifies an effective principal or, or the state identifies an effective principal, how do you really like work on um, retention efforts to make sure that those principals stay in their schools and their districts? Um, one way that a lot of folks are doing this is really leaning into professional learning communities. PLCs, I feel like, can be kind of buzzy, a buzzwordy, but thinking through like, what does it mean to have a like real functional professional learning community that's focused on, you know, this transition of students from high school into the post-secondary space. Uh, what data can you bring to the table to talk about that? Um, how can you get principals together talking about different strategies that have worked for them and their schools, right? So sharing that knowledge is really important. Um, and then in terms of thinking of who's coming up through the pipeline into the principalship, um, you know, thinking about like, how do we intentionally do things so that we're making sure that we're diversifying the pipeline into the principal shift, right? There's research is continuing to suggest that having diverse representation of teachers is really important for students. Um, and this could be a potential future area of research too, thinking about how important is that for principals as well. Um, and then one piece of that, right? I'm in an institute of higher education. I am in a school of education where we train future school leaders. So thinking about, you know, principal training programs, be them in IHEs or alternative programs. Um, how do you ensure that those training programs are really um, designed so that the coursework, internship, residency experiences really ensure that um, future school leaders get what they need out of it um, to transition into the principalship. And then thinking about making sure that folks as they move into sort of teacher leadership roles or the assistant principalship, like I mentioned, really get a range of robust experiences so that they're not really siloed into doing one task, but making sure that even as teachers and APs, they're getting good mentorship and getting a chance to um, develop different skill sets that they'll need um, when they leave their own buildings. Appreciate you sharing that, Lauren. And I, I wanna take an opportunity to bring in um, Jen for, for just a, a little bit, who again, um, serves as the Executive Director of Teaching and Learning at the Illinois State Board of Education. Uh, Jen, you've got the state level system leader hat on. You've also been a, a former school leader. Um, and so would appreciate just hearing about some of the work that ISB has done to strengthen principal leadership, um, as well as any examples that are specific to st strengthening principal leadership uh, around post-secondary readiness efforts. Sure. Thanks, Andy. So, um, you know, I think generally we have several efforts that have been sort of ongoing um, that we made the decision as the state to invest some ESSER dollars to um, sort of increase capacity and grow certain efforts um, and, and some specific examples of ways um, that we used ESSER dollars to particularly strengthen and support um, principal leadership um, were through uh, the funding of a new principal mentoring grant. Um, so we used some ESSER funds for a competitive grant, um, several different entities covering sort of all of the, all of the spaces in Illinois um, applied and directly serves new principals. Um, we also, um, you know, sort of speaking to, to what's one of the things on this slide here, um, we also used uh, some funding to 
introduce a specific effort to diversify the principal pipeline. There is a program uh, that's purpose is literally um, to, to engage and to attract and recruit um, really successful um, educators of color to begin to consider the principalship and, and start their journey. And that, you know, the, the programs that utilize those funds really do focus on um, you know, creating spaces and messaging to make sure um, that that folks um, working in our system who have great potential to to be an effective principal um, sort of know that they're recognized and that there are specific opportunities and supports for them as they go through preparation to make that shift, um, maybe from a teacher leader to a to a building leader. Um, the Initiative, though, that is most specific to um, strengthening leadership with regard to post-secondary readiness um, was also ESSER funded. Um, and so it uh, ISB or the State Board of Education as the state education agency in Illinois has obviously been uh, working on designing and implementing policies and programs related to um, improving and increasing college and career readiness for some time. Um, but like I think everyone else in the nation and the country, the uh, disruptions that student experience, students experienced um, really at the beginning of the pandemic, um, followed by sort of this immediate influx of federal relief dollars, really caused us to take a step back and say, what are all the aspects of the student experience that have been impacted here? And what are we doing um, to try to support recovery in all of those areas? And so wanting specifically to offer some support um, to students um, who, whose preparation for the transition between high school and college was uh, incredibly disrupted. Uh, we formed a partnership with One Goal. Um, and what we did was actually offer opportunities for districts to engage in that leadership network that Andy uh, spoke about on an earlier slide. Um, and the design of the partnership focusing on the leadership network um, as opposed to the direct model, at least at first, was really intentional. Um, we wanted our practicing school leaders who had so many um, competing priorities and just such, such I mean, full plate even doesn't begin to describe, I think, um, as many of you, I'm sure know, what what school leadership life was like um, for folks, you know, as we made our way out of school, um, out of remote learning and back into in-person learning. And so, um, so we wanted to provide support specifically to leaders and to their leadership and post-secondary teams um, because we recognized that that was necessary and because ultimately we know that this kind of work um, is about uh, is about designing and implementing systems and systems work is is leadership. And by using one-time funds to develop leaders who can develop systems, uh, the effort will play, pay dividends long after the life cycle of the funding uh, is over. Those are really, um, really important reflections, Jen. And um, uh, I'll, I'll ask our team to put a blog post that was on uh, NCAN's blog post the last couple of days in the chat. And it um, was similar to some of what, what you shared about school leadership is really hard. Um, and thinking about school leadership with the post-secondary readiness lens is even harder. School leaders only have so much capacity to advance a multitude of priorities. And we don't train or support principals or teachers for that matter um, in the way that they can effectively support post-secondary readiness. And, and I think what we have heard from the leaders we work with is we want support, we want coaching, uh, we want to be in communities of practice with our peers, uh, which to Lauren's point is unfortunately more the exception uh, than the rule in the way that we support principal leadership um, across, across this country. Um, so lots of barriers, um, but also lots of opportunities to strengthen this, this work around principal leadership. Um, I'm going to uh, bring uh, Narita um, back, back kind of on, on the screen so we can start our, our panel discussion. Um, and so what we're going to do for about the 
uh, next 20, 20, 25 minutes or so um, is to just in, engage in a QA uh, with our panel. Uh, we've been kind of taking note of some of the questions that you've dropped in the chat and are kind of adding them to our list. And so we'll do our best um, to get to them. And as uh, you hear responses from our panelists, please continue adding in the chat additional follow up questions that, that you might have so we can uh, make sure to address those. Um, I'll, I'll just kick things off to a, a question specific to uh, Narita and Jen. Um, Principals have competing priorities. They have limited resources. Um, what are the strategies that they can use that make the highest impact on the long-term student outcomes like post-secondary enrollment and persistence that we've been talking about? Um, I believe as principals, we have to be very intentional when it comes to post-secondary readiness. Um, the most important thing that we have to do is develop a plan, um, make sure that we are collaborating and uh, working with staff as well as students and just making sure that we are covering every important aspect of their future, making sure that they have those options to take those career interest surveys. Um, one very important thing that we've started here, of course, we have the one go classroom model and the students start their junior year and transition on out to their first college year. But just uh, helping to prepare them recently, I had a student, I just asked the other day, I said, you know, how are you liking the classroom model? And he said to me, it's helping me discover things about myself that I didn't know. So with limited resources, I just feel like as a school, we have to think about the opportunities that our students don't have and just being making sure we're really strategic about coming up with the plan to assist them. That's awesome, Narita. Thanks for sharing. Uh, when I was a school leader, we also used the, the classroom model and it was incre an incredibly powerful experience for many of our students as well. Um, what I would say to how how principals can best um, keep post-secondary preparation and readiness a focus is actually what most people responded to on the poll earlier, which is build it into the strategic plan or the school improvement plan. And the detail I would add to that is that it's incredibly important to have clear goals for what it means for you in your context and for your students to be experiencing um, post-secondary success. What are the immediate indicators that you can look at now while students are still in high school that are predictive? What are the indicators um, or metrics you're gonna have to wait to get data on? What is your plan for gathering all of those data and what resources are necessary for that? All of those things need to be built into the plan from the beginning, especially that data collection piece, because it's really a challenge in this space. The other thing about strategic plans is that like through nobody's fault, they sometimes end up on the shelf. Um, and I think a, a school leader's really one of their most important responsibilities is to keep that plan alive, to keep it at the center. It has to be good to start with. It has to be the things that matter to you and to your school community, but then you are the one who keeps it alive for people. Um, so that's that's what I have on strategic plan. I also think given the limited capacity of, of school leaders as a single human being who is often expected to be a superhero and, and are superheroes, it's really important to think about the ways to use distributed leadership in this space. I think sometimes we think about distributed leadership very much in on the academic side. Um, we have department chairs and we have um, P, um, PLC facilitators, but also think about what are all the responsibilities that are necessary for an effective post-secondary support system for students who does each of those jobs? How do they communicate with each other? Um, and it shouldn't be that everyone is doing the same job. Not every teacher is equipped to be a counselor, though many think sometimes that they are. And so having a plan that encompasses every adult in your building and what their role and responsibility are and giving 
the appropriate preparation and guidance and support so that everyone can play their role effectively in the system is really important. I'd love to ask Lauren too to, to kind of follow up on, on what you heard from Jen and Narita. Yeah, y'all, I wrote down distributed leadership in my notebook to make sure I said it if you guys didn't. And so I'm right there with you both, right? If you have limited capacity and you have a million tasks on your plate, how do you think about um, bringing teachers in? Um, principals are powerful because they set the stage, right? They set the expectations, they set the school climate, they set the school culture. And so what we know is, you can create a college going culture school ride, right? It doesn't just have to live with the school counselor. It doesn't have to live with like my amazing calculus teacher, right? If this is a, it's a school wide thing. And I think Jen, that's, and Jen and Rita both, you are trying to make that point too, is it can't just live with one person or a handful of people the same way that school principals are stretched really thin. We know school counselors also stretch really thin, right? In terms of the, you know, counselor to student ratio on the ground in schools, again, post pandemic, we know it's really, really high. And so it can't just live with one person. And like the key part that the principal plays, right, is they're, they're the drivers, they set those expectations. Um, and so I just wanted to like echo what you guys are saying and say that like that's important from a research perspective as well. Yeah, I I think um when I think back to the the 2000s or 2010s, I think post secondary readiness often lived with the counselor uh, in, in a high school and it expanded slowly to maybe an assistant principal who was also charged with post secondary readiness. And what I'm hearing from you all is, and we need to keep expanding that network to the principal, to district leaders who work who, who work with the schools, to additional teachers. Um, so it is cultural um, in a school uh, as opposed to siloed. And I think the other thing that I heard that, that really sticks out to me um, is the how do you, we not just put the strategic plan on a shelf, um, but make it something that is influencing our daily actions and habits. So Narita, I'd kind of love to come to you uh, about that. As you think about the goals and the plan that you have for your school, what do you do to make that a reality day to day, week to week? So it's not just something you worked on April through June one year, and then it went somewhere in your Google Drive, but it's something that informs um, your building's work. As far as just not sticking it away on a shelf, I think the most important thing um, that we do here, we just hold each other accountable with the million tasks that a principal deal with on a daily basis. It's very important to just delegate and have others in place to assist you. Um, right now, my student academic support specialist is responsible for like overseeing the one go classroom model. I currently don't have a counselor, so that makes the advising component even more complicated for us. But just making sure, once again, we clarify those roles and uh, we work together. And if we say we're going to do something, we are constantly working with one goal to plan any important events or informational nights that we need and just making sure we don't throw it away. The most important thing is accountability and we just hold each other accountable, accountable even with the million other tasks that we have. That's great, that's great. Uh, I'm gonna go to, to Jen um, with a question next. Um, speaking of accountability, uh, I, I think one of the things that can help advance principal leadership and school leader work around post-secondary readiness is thinking about the goals that can get, can be a part of accountability metrics at the state level. And I think if we scanned all the accountability metrics across 50 states and report cards, you'd see fewer metrics about post-secondary readiness than you might see about uh, instructional work or culture and climate work. Um, and so, Jen, if you could maybe speak to some of the, the work that you guys have done at the state level to also elevate elevate post-secondary readiness uh, metrics in the K-12 space. I think that would be great. And just maybe where you see that going in the next couple of years. Sure. Um, so uh, this is a really complicated space. Um, uh, you know, states, I think, sometimes seem to have a lot of uh, flexibility and autonomy in terms of accountability systems, but there are also um, a lot of constraints and also sort of a lot of competing priorities, just um, as there are in, in school buildings. We have, um, we have tried, um, actually since before the pandemic, and we've 
sort of regrouped and rethought some things to have um, accountability indicators um, that speak to post-secondary readiness. Um, in the high school, um, we have tried to create a, a set of um, of readiness indicators, and uh, we are still in the process of figuring out the best and most um, sort of accurate way to collect all of those data from districts. Um, a lot of the um, a lot of the indicators are not things we have historically collected because they're about experiences, um, which we know are critical to to setting students up for post-secondary success. And there just hasn't been a way to collect those things. So that is something that admittedly is still a work in progress. Um, for um, students at younger grades, we have incorporated um, on track metrics, which, um, you know, the obviously the consortium um, has a, a long history of, of providing information and um, supports and evidence about what on track rates are and why they matter so much. And I'm sure um, many of my um, my fellow organizers here can put um, lots of information in the chat for anyone who's interested in reading more about that. But I think um, it's really it's really important for us to begin um, thinking early about what the indicators are and what the experiences are, um, and to go through a you know an accountability design and redesign process that is that is rooted in evidence and in data um, that is transparent and that um, really emphasizes stakeholder engagement. Yeah, I think one of the things that um, I, I think is is helpful for principals in strengthening student post-secondary readiness is not to over rely on a single data point and just say, all of my kids are on track or all of my kids have completed an internship, but it's to look at the totality of the picture that combines those experiences, their grades, whether or not they completed the FAFSA, the coursework they're engaged in to get a holistic picture of whether students are college and career ready. Um, and so I think there is some exciting work in Illinois and other states to kind of work on and develop those composite me measures so they are an authentic representation of where students are. Um, and in a way that complements, I think, some of the, the work that Illinois and other states have done to share back with K-12 leaders the post-secondary enrollment trends of students um, so they can be mindful of where they're they're going post-graduation. Um, I'm going to uh, turn to, to Lauren in a little bit. Um, there has been, I think, a, a, a lot of research in the last five or 10 years around school leaders and how they matter and why they matter. Um, and this is similar to the research you shared today. I'm curious to hear where you think there are opportunities to continue this type of research um, in the future. Sure. I mean, I think one thing that's really important is we just need more of it, right? I think one thing that's coming up in this accountability conversation um, is, you know, we're starting to put more metrics into accountability systems. And so I'm curious both as a public school parent, but also a researcher about how, you know, policy, district policymakers or state level policymakers can then provide supports to schools to really set them up for success in terms of making sure that students you know, are gaining the skills, having the experiences that they need, moving away from the test score focus right to these other sort of post-secondary outcomes and thinking about, you know, the kinds of resources that we might need in schools so that there are more school counselors, um, so that the ratios aren't so high. Um, you know, in the public school space, that's easy to say, but hard to do given our financial realities sometimes. Um, I think, you know, one thing the accountability conversation also reminds me of is I know a number of districts, Chicago is one of them, um, that is, has put, you know, a like accountability around sort of high, how high schools are helping students prepare for college in the workforce. And so in Chicago Public Schools, um, they have a program called Learn, Plan, Succeed. And it's basically each student to graduate from high school must have a post-secondary plan. You must know what you are doing next. And so 
how do schools get the resources they need to actually support students in making those plans so that they don't become like the school improvement plans, just the checking the box and going on the shelf, but so that they're actually something meaningf meaningful stu for students um, as they transition. And so from a research perspective, you know, Chicago is not the only one doing this. I know DC is also doing something like this. I'm sure there are many other districts as well. So I think research side by side as those kinds of things continue um, to roll out can help us think about, you know, is is this accountability mechanism actually like helping improve outcomes of young adults? And if there are barriers, why and what are those? Um, and so what what do schools need to do to really like make those plans not just be a box that they're checking, but something that students can relate um, use to make that transition. Uh, I'm going to ask this this question to, to all of our panelists. Um, Jen, you, you brought up um, ESSER, uh, which we know is uh, um, in the final stages. Uh, and you talked about some of the investments that uh, uh, Illinois made around school leadership development, which I think is, is a common theme across the country. Um, I'm going to put a uh, link in the, in the chat from a McKinsey study um, that came out earlier this fall. Um, and it, it shows the spending priorities of school leaders across the country, learning loss, social emotional learning, and there's about 20 of them on there. Uh, and post-secondary readiness is at the bottom of the list. Um, and so my, my question to you all is, what do we need to do to kind of help elevate post-secondary readiness work at the school leader level so it's seen proportionally to other priorities, knowing that it's not because school leaders don't care about what happens to students after graduation. It is a systemic challenge. Um, and so I'm curious to hear what you think we can do to, to elevate this work at the school leader level. So, um, you know, I really think that this issue ultimately boils down to perspectives on the purpose of high school. And I think that sometimes high school is thought of as the end of something, and sometimes it's thought of as the beginning of something. And I would push us all to think of high school as, this is very cliche, but the beginning of the rest of your life, because that is, you know, from my perspective, that is what it is. And the value of high school um, is not the diploma that you get from it, though that is, you know, symbolically and emotionally important. It is a rite of passage, but it is not really the end. Um, you are still very much at the beginning of your life, uh, at the beginning of your working life, at the beginning of your adult life. And we need to, as people who care deeply about what is happening in high schools, we need to sort of remember that. Um, Post-secondary outcomes are the ultimate measure of our success as a school. But as I said earlier, they are very hard to measure and the things that get measured get done. And so until we find better ways and have be better and more connected and more efficient data systems, I think it's it, you know, I think that's that is the next step that we need to all sort of think about together. I think everybody is doing their best to create things on their own. Um, and depending upon resources and capacity, the results are like wildly different across districts, across states, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, so I do think that's that's a key is figuring out, you know, how how do we measure this and how do we measure it? as I said, like, how do we measure the leading indicators and the lagging indicators? What are they and how do we measure them and how do we define those data? Um, because then we can really set goals around it. And when, I mean, school leaders are trained to achieve the goals that are set forth. Um, principals are, are absolutely leaders, um, but they are also middle managers. They report to district leaders who report to, in most cases, elected school boards. And so um, so we are, as, as leaders, speaking as a former leader now, really in the middle. Um, and it is going to take the whole, the whole ecosystem 
saying that this is important and putting resources on what success is and how we measure it, I think to help principals devote more of their energy and capacity to this issue. I definitely agree. I can honestly say from uh, coming in with my first year as a secondary principal, all I could think about was I have to get these students across the stage. That was my goal. And when I look at that experience and I think back to last year, of course, I did have some students go off to college, some that left us with their CNA certification, things of that nature. But for the most part, as we got closer to the end of that school year and I was having those conversations like, what are your plans after high school? Uh, I don't know. Um, how are we really setting our students up for any type of success when we don't have those plans in place? So it is just very significant that we work hard to prepare them um, my view completely changed. Uh, one of the phrases that I was thinking of when Jen was speaking, it changed from getting them across that stage to preparation. All I could think about was getting through to preparation. Last year, for me coming in, all I thought my main focus was, was getting them across that stage. This year, I am more interested in prepping them for their futures um, we're not perfect here. We're constantly striving to find new ways to be able to offer different career options and paths to our students. Um, for example, we have started dual credit with one of the offsite local college campuses, and it's trial and error. It didn't go the best this year. Um, we realized we had some gaps in the situation, but just making sure we continuously learn from those mistakes and continuously think of ways that we can just better prepare the students and just want to recognize that this is a significant import, uh, importance. We don't want to just set the kids up for failure and have them leaving us with no plan. Uh, that that really resonates, um, uh, Narita. I think uh, when you said switching from getting them across the graduation stage to preparing, I, I can't see the um, participants who are on, but I'm pretty sure everybody nodded their head to that um, because that I think is a theme that uh, we see and experience loudly and clearly um, from the school leaders and the district leaders that we work with uh, across the country. Um, because we love love links at one goal, um, we'll put one more reading that I was thinking of as, as Jen was talking in the chat that's um, about the state of the American student from the Center for Reinventing Public Education. And it's speaks to what Jen referenced, uh, which is um, this is an ecosystem challenge. It can't just be on the shoulders of school leaders or just counselors or CTE coaches. And um, we need some reimagining of this work uh, across the broader landscape. Um, so we are going to wrap up. Um, and I just want to say thank you to Lauren, uh, to Jen, to Narita um, for the conversation today. Lauren, for sharing your, your research. Um, I have a much clearer view of what the work ahead entails. Uh, and to the audience, um, thank you so much for joining us today.